Okay, so it's about eight o'clock. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're gonna go ahead and get going. So welcome everybody to our LMS. This topic is on uh, BD practices and interview skills in a virtual world. So I would, look, would like to start by introducing our panelists. So Hillary, Hillary Weinstein, if you could uh, wave, let everybody know where you are, high impact communication, marketing, consulting, all things, prepping, interview skills, everything in that world. Uh, Russ Sanders, principal with Smith Group, if you could wave. Pretty easy to see who you are in this group. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of mystery there. And then Wendy Springboard, uh, engineering services at, at City of Tempe. So welcome everybody. So it is eight o'clock. We have about 85, 83 people on the line. Uh, so welcome everybody. That's about where we expected to be. So thank you all for making the time and good job getting logged in. That is kind of the first test of all these, isn't it? Uh, if you have not done so, please do feel free to introduce yourself if you'd like to join the conversation. We are using the chat function. So down at the bottom, your toolbar, wherever it pops up, you're welcome to use the chat. Uh, please do use your name and your company name, and then make sure your message goes to all panelists and attendees if you'd like to send it to the whole group. Uh, you're welcome to do so. All right, and with that, I'm going to start off with a poll. So I'm going to do this right now. Panelists, you are invited to uh, participate in the poll. So you should see this popping up here. Uh, in your, you should get a pop-up window. <clears throat> and I have three questions. So three quick questions just to see what are you looking for today? What are you looking forward to most? And then uh, any experience that you've had with virtual interviews? And then also, I really wanted to gauge like who's asking for these interviews, the public side or the private side? To us, public side is uh, public owners, agencies, municipalities, school districts, higher education, state universities, all that good stuff. Uh, private owners to us is healthcare, except for MIHS, I consider them publicly funded. Um, and then the developer side, so any apartments, hospitality, office buildings, industrial, all that good stuff. So we're gonna give it a few minutes, let everybody answer. <clears throat> and then I will show off all these answers. Like I mentioned, it's one of the coolest things is to get everybody's feedback, to get everybody's engagement. Uh -huh. We love to see what people are doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so I'm gonna give it about another minute. So far, we've got about 70% of uh, all attendees have answered the question. So thank you very much for your feedback. <clears throat> I'm so looking forward to hearing the feedback. It's like we're sitting here just like <laughs> <laughs> chomping at the bit, want to find out what, what it is. All right, so we're at 74% of engagement, 75, 76, yay. I was telling everybody earlier, uh, we did this, the poll uh, functionality last, last LMS was the very first time I, I tried that functionality or that little feature. And we got about 80% engagement with our initial poll. So I considered that very, very good. And I really liked it. And of course, I always get a tickle in my throat right when I try and talk, so. All right, I'm gonna give it another 10 seconds or so. We've got our 80% engagement, so good job, everybody. Okay, let's go ahead and end this and let's share our results. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so everybody should see a little pop up there. Uh, it, it looks like you, you're able to see our results. So number one, what are you looking forward to most today? I really wanted to see the virtual BD practices. So 58% of respondents there, very cool. And then experience so far with multiple or with virtual interviews. I've not done one yet and we're not 
don't have anything scheduled, so you guys are definitely getting ready. And then a few people, 38% have also have done more than or at least one, but less than three. Perfect. And then who's requesting? Uh, we're looking at public owners. So, okay. Awesome. That's kind of our, our responses so far. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for participating. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get into our questions. So we do have a, a list of questions. For anybody that has questions or would like to ask questions of the panel, please do use the Q&A function. So that's different than the chat, but please feel free to ask questions. We are gonna get through the ones that we have prepared so far, and then we will get to audience Q&A at the end. So we should have plenty of time. I think we're gonna be just fine on time. Uh, so with that, I'd like to start off with an introductory question. We really wanna compare now to three to six months ago. So in late 2019, even into January and February of 2020, things were going great. And then all of a sudden we stopped. We hit a little bit of a wall. Uh, Russ, I wanna ask you first, what would a typical week have looked like in January? What would your you know, BD practices, your average BD kind of week, what would that have looked like? Well, you know, I mean, it was it was all about uh, you know coffees and lunches and happy hours and uh, you know uh, a lot of a lot of team meetings. And then when we did meet, it was in a room. Uh, it was really bizarre. We we'd all get in the same room together, uh, and uh, you know, I, I kind of have a reputation for for scribbling on walls on dry erase marker boards, and so. Um, Although, you know, in, in the AEC industry, we have a, you know, a big advantage in terms of all the cloud-based technology that we use every day anyway. Uh, it seemed like all, most of that stuff could come home with us. And, and that transition, any project that was in production was really easy to manage, but all the touch points with the clients and all the opportunities to engage became really challenging. And, um, we found a software uh, called Mural that allows you to do like a multiple sort of interactive whiteboard kind of scenario. I mean, it's not, it's not as good, but it's close. Huh. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, big picture idea, but we, we certainly uh, fell off the cliff there uh, right around, I think March 12th uh, was the last full day. We had a, we had a, the 13th off and I never came back. So. Okay. All right, perfect. We'll get into that in just a second. Uh, Hillary, question to you. You know, you consult for a lot of AEC firms and you give advice and you help people be successful doing business development and, and winning work. What kind of advice did you give to clients three to six months ago? And how has that changed from then to now? Oh, Hillary, I think you're Well, first. I guess, did I freeze? Yeah. Am I still like, frozen? <laughs> no, you're good. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, I guess in my world, it's been very interesting. Whereas before, it was a combination of training and interview preparation for in-person scenarios. What I'm finding now is more and more requests to do virtual interview prep and more importantly, to assist in this new technological method of trying to communicate and connect with clients, which is very different on a small screen when, when we're used to communicating in person. So even though folks have been doing meetings and things like that on the small screen for a little while, to do so effectively in an interview is very different. Definitely. All right, Wendy, question to you. What changes have you made to procurement at the city level, in person, and then what, what all has changed? Right. Well, from, from a procurement perspective, we really, we're not doing any in-person meetings. It's all virtual, whether it's video, audio conferencing, or just audio conferencing, um, but just we're, we're, we're not doing that. So we're using different platforms, Microsoft um, Meeting, Zoom, phone, um, but it almost seems like we're busier because now you don't have to take into account travel times. So it's like you literally can go, you know, from one meeting to the next to the next and not miss a beat because of that. 
So there's been positives that you can be maybe more productive during the day, but, um, and then pre-bid and site meetings, we're not holding those either at this point in time. Um, we've always allowed for like a Q&A ahead of time that people can submit questions about what is in the, the bid documents or um, the RFQ. Um, but one of the things that we're gonna be trying on this next one is uh, because of secure sites, you know, and then the social distancing of doing um, like 360 videos that we can put out on our uh, website so that people can be able to at least visualize what's inside the building that they need to be able to um, do their uh, bid projects on. Okay. And um, then as far as the RFQs, I'm, I'm excited on both the RFQs and IFBs is that it's all electronic now. So from a, um, a time perspective and a savings pers perspective, um, consultants aren't having to put together or contractors aren't having to put together these elaborate proposals. It's all online and they just send me one and then I can distribute it all over the place. So um, I've definitely seen a, a positive from that is that we're you know, decreasing costs to uh, the people that want to do business with Tempe, Tempe but also um, uh, the environment. We're not killing as many trees now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will say um, I haven't seen a decrease in the sophistication in proposals. Like you're saving us about, usually we allow almost a day or so for print. So I don't know how many, how, how long everybody else uses for print, but our goal is always to get them to print at least a day ahead of time. So you're saving mm -hmm. us about a day, which is awesome. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the proposal still gotta, still gotta get them in. I, I don't know if we're dropping anything in terms of sophistication. <laughs> so very yep. good. excellent. Okay, first big topic. So that's kind of our introduction, our introduction, um, moving from six months ago, three to six months ago, over to now. Uh, now we want to talk the logistics and mechanics of preparing for a virtual interview. So very specific to the interview step, I uh, really want to ask, uh, Wendy, what, I'm going to go to you first, because I want to know, yeah. what do you look for in an interview? So a team comes into interview, what kinds of things are you really looking for from the team? Um, again, it's, it's that dynamic between the team members. Um, you know, it'll be a little bit more challenging because of, you know, sometimes you get, get the glitches in the video and, and that type of thing. But just seeing how they work together as a team, um, definitely that the team that they're presenting at the interview is the same team they proposed in the SOQ. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, we're definitely queuing on that, but we're going to have the, you know, the same time frames and just a flow, not necessarily um, for us scripted. You know, if somebody's sitting there just reading and not engaging the panel um, is sometimes a challenge. Um, but we're also not looking for something that's so professional and slick that you feel like it's more the, the no offense to the BD folks, but the BD folks doing it who are used to doing those types of presentations versus the project manager or the superintendent. So it's really all the same factors that we look for in the face-to-face. -face. It's just, you know, how, how to come across that in a virtual meeting. Okay, perfect. Uh, Russ and Hillary, talk to me a little bit about the logistics of a virtual interview. So I think I'm going to go to you first, Hillary. Talk to me about the sound, the, the look, the, the whole, you know, mechanics of it. How well, do you get you ready? So let, I think the best way to do it is to contrast it with the traditional way of doing interviews. So in terms of preparing for a virtual interview, one of the most important things is lighting, being able to see the person that you're wanting to connect with. So as you're preparing, it becomes incredibly important to figure out what color and what background is going to help focus on the eyes and the mouth. Because when people smile and show enthusiasm, it's all here and here. Um, the other thing is, is that on a small screen, things become amplified. So where as big gestures used to be okay in uh, an interview setting that was live, those big gestures on the small screen can be very distracting. The other thing is because everybody is being shown 
anything that you do when you're not presenting is right up there to be seen. So be aware of that. Um, it's important to practice and record yourself because if you have no clue how you're coming across, you don't know what adaptations to make. Sure. Russ, how about you? How do you guys prepare? <clears throat> well, um, I, would, I would say first and foremost, um, we've learned that, you know, you have to practice in the platform that you're going to be presenting in it. I mean, it sounds pretty obvious, but we have clients ask us to use other technology. And um, so there's an adaptation that needs to happen there. Uh, we have, you know, some recommendations on lighting obviously if you're if you're backlit you're silhouetted um even you know as we go through and we practice we we usually have somebody from bd or somebody act as a coach through the process um and just to see if our message is coming across as we as we sort of intend but there's you know there's little things like like the framing of the video like sometimes people sit down in the corner and then there's a <laughs> band of text across their face or you know that they, they don't see it on their image but it you know that's the way the audience sees it so you know um the framing the lighting um audio i think i standardize on using the phone for audio and for the one reason is if you lose your video connection you, you're still on the call mm -hmm. but also any kind of noises or alerts that are coming through your computer you can you can mute your computer audio um, and also mute yourself when you're not talking. Certain platforms will zoom your face big just because you shuffled a piece of paper when somebody else is presenting. Um, uh, let's see, camera position. We talked about clothing choice. If you wear a super crazy striped shirt, you're going to have this moire effect uh, on the video. Um, and then the chore choreography of the presentation itself so that you're not, you know, you know, uh, how many times in a Zoom meeting do you say, no, sorry, go ahead, sorry, go ahead, sorry, go ahead, because people are talking on top of each other. Uh, so uh, we we put a lot of energy into, you know, if there's going to be a lean in, uh, there's going to be one lean in and it's going to be happen exactly now, you know, and then we'll have a, if there's a kind of a special need to, need to call an audible, uh, we'll have a, a text going on the side, a group text with the entire team so that you, you know, hey, you got it. So it's, you know, it's not, you know, super sort of mechanical and it needs to feel, I think, like we're human beings. Um, and so, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, to Wendy's point, you know, if anybody's made it to the interview is probably qualified to do the project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our job now is to sort of say, Wendy, um, we, would you like to work with us for the next two years on Project X? And so we try to come across as human. And, and then lastly, usually one person is clicking the slides. And so we really need to rehearse it enough time so we know sort of just how much time to, to sort of hang out on one slide and still hit the, you know, the timing requirements for the presentation. So. Sure. A few okay, ideas. So that brings up a kind of a natural question. Slides or no slides? Russ, do you always use slides for your virtual interviews? We do, um, but they're full bleed, beautiful, highly graphical images, and the words come out of our mouths. Uh, there's not a lot of words on the slides. Uh, that tends to be our approach. Okay. Hillary, slides or no slides? I think that if, if it's necessary to support your message, then utilize that. Um, another approach may be to create some sort of handout for your panel to write notes on or to let them know that it will be available afterwards so that they don't have to take as many notes. The important thing and the most challenging thing about using this format is trying to connect with the panel. And the more they look at slides, the less ability they have to connect with your team. Okay. Okay. Another kind of uh, mechanical question or logistics type question, virtual backdrops. Are you guys a fan? Not a fan? I'm not a fan. I think it's important for folks mm -hmm. to see you in your environment, but 
be cognizant of the environment that's behind you. Is it too distracting? Um, does it portray what you want to portray to your client? Is it going to help you portray warmth? Or is it going to help you portray uh, professionalism? Or, you know, what are the things that you can communicate, not just by your presence, but also by the environment that surrounds you? So it should never be a distraction. It should always be something that, where it allows the focus to be on you. Okay. Yeah. Rest, anything to add? I'd, no, I would just say that the virtual background is great for a virtual happy hour and uh, not so good for interviews, in my opinion. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Wendy? And just as an owner, um, building on Hillary's point, I would rather see the faces than slides, mm. but if you send the slides ahead of time that we can follow along, that you know we know what page you're on, you know, that type of thing versus, because we want to see the people. We, we want to get to know the people. And the information that you're providing on the slides is extra, I guess. Okay. And you know, if we can follow along with it, that that's great. Um, but yeah, I want to I want to see faces. I want to see the people. Okay. And then what about the post event? Uh, what kind of do you resend like a recap, or what do you do with the the post interview kind of follow up? What recommendations, or what would you want to see? Oh, I'm going to go to you, Hillary, first. Well, uh, there obviously you can't follow up with the client until after the selection has been made. But to give them something like the slides or to send them a placemat that has all of your folks on it with their names, okay. um, their roles on the project, something that's very simple and not too complex to look down and then come up. Okay. but something that reinforces your message so like a placemat do you mean like the almost like an org chart with the headshots and the name title role on the project something but like only the people that are presenting okay okay because that helps folks connect and it should be the picture with the name if you're going to do something like that because then it's a, an easy reference after the fact for them to reconnect with the person okay perfect russ what do you think about post event kind of materials or slides or placemats or anything like that? Sorry, I lost my uh, clicker. <laughs> I'm getting heckled by some of our uh, audience members. Um, <laughs> we, we tend to, uh, <laughs> tend to uh, send the deck in advance, like, a, you know, a few hours in advance. And sometimes we send a placemat with our kind of names. Um, uh, post, you know, we're, I'm not sure what we can really do post interview um, other than, uh, you know, light a candle and, and say a prayer, but um, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> <You too? laughs> yeah, one of the things along the, along the lines of the, of the placemat though, um, you know, and I, I've done it here today. We, when we were fortunate enough to use Zoom, you can actually rename yourself and a lot of times we'll put you know, you know, partner in charge or whatever. You can actually modify your, um, you know, name in the in the window, which we found useful, and maybe even be a little more a little more like casual with it, and just have your first name and your role, okay. just so people understand, um, kind of uh, at a glance what's going on. But yeah, we're 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 still um, uh, we're still sort of trying to reinvent that whole that whole process a little bit it's, it was, it's interesting to hear wendy's point of view on the on the interview images we, we tend to be pretty heavy on images and and it's true you get um when we get to the q a we usually save we usually exit out of the presentation so that our our yeah. images become larger so we can we can have that engagement mm -hmm. um and i think there's probably been a, a bigger emphasis on you know, getting through the presentation faster and, and allowing the Q&A to be uh, more impactful rather than just giving like a quick 10, 15 minutes at the end. Okay, interesting. Wendy, I'm gonna ask you specifically something that Hillary said. Uh, can you talk to us about any procurement rules that would be 
you know, we wouldn't want to bump up against procurement rules if we right. sent something after the interview, but before the selection, can you chime in on that? And then do you have any feedback for Russ and for Hillary on the things that they mentioned on sending slide decks ahead of time and placemats and renaming and all mm -hmm. that stuff? Um, I, I, I like the idea of the slide deck ahead of time, you know, even if it's just an hour or two ahead of time, just so that we've got it in front of us for it. Um, with the different, even face-to-face -face interviews, um, it has varied based upon the, the agency. You know, either they don't give us the, the slideshow presentation copies ahead of time, they wait till afterwards. Um, I've had the, the placemats or um, I think more common now is just you, you get this like, I don't know, two by 11 size, you know, uh, that has all the pictures and the names of the people. So it's not a full placemat, but it's just a little, little piece of, of, of leave behind so that during the interview, we're seeing who it is. But if we've got the video, then, you know, and, and hopefully titles and stuff on there. Um, that's been good. But as far as anything, you know, immediately past, I think you, you just have to be careful about communicating after the, the, the presentation. You know, a quick little thank you for this opportunity is great, but any more trying to sell or anything like that is just, you're, you're kind of getting towards the, the edge of not really mm. doing what you should be doing. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. All right. So we're now we're going to, so that was kind of the logistics and the mechanics of delivering a virtual interview. Talk to me about the messaging, you know, the content and the theme and how we can convey all the things that are important. Um, you know, the typical things I see is like, are you good communicators? And mm -hmm. do you have really good experience with this type of work? And do you work well together? So Wendy, I'm going to ask you first, what okay. messages or what themes uh, with an interview are most impactful and uh, the takeaway messages from a well-delivered interview, what are the most kind of, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, like interpersonal skills or, you know, right. what they're saying, what can they convey to you as right. a business owner? So um, from, you know, at least my perspective or owner's perspective, you know, we're looking for that team dynamic that, you know, they're not stepping all over each other. One person's not trying to, to run the whole presentation, that they, they're kind of sharing their own areas of expertise, um, but that they're demonstrating that they've kind of, they've done their due diligence. They've researched the project. This isn't a cut and paste, um, you know, interview, the same thing with SOQ, that could be answered for just about any type of project. You know, they've got specifics of what, we are in particular looking for. So clear understanding of the project and a clear description of how they're going to approach the project. And it really, you know, we can tell when people are just, you know, phoning home with it versus they've really done some research on the project to have a better understanding of what we're looking for. Okay. Russ, how do you communicate that through a virtual interview? How do you communicate teamwork and you know that we are very custom and we're very much approaching this just to your project Mr. Owner, Mrs. Owner. Uh, well <clears throat> you know we're fortunate in a lot of the projects we, we've been going after lately where the the same team uh, that's worked together on multiple projects is is kind of reassembled and so that's helpful. I mean I, th I don't think you can fake you know, chemistry in some ways, it just sort of has to be true. Um, it seems like if there's like a little bit of a, you know, intro sort of, uh, or a few minutes before the presentation um, where you're just talking casually about nothing, like, you know, that there's almost, you know, more value in that uh, in sometimes than, you know, <laughs> in the presentation itself, that the more you can just sort of sort of be human and, and, and interact and, uh, you know, sort of empathize, it's helpful. But, um, you know, we put a lot of energy into trying to put the right people in the right roles uh, to make sure that they're not just sort of reading a speech about what that person would, would do. Uh, they're actually the right person to, to, to tackle that piece. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, and then, you know, a lot of rehearsal, <laughs> uh, but, uh, 
Hillary. Yeah. How about you? How do you coach clients on conveying teamwork and communication skills, interpersonal skills in a virtual setting? Well, I following up on what Russ said is that it's important to communicate the people and why this person is the right person for the job, not just their experience. The other thing I like is to include something that's unique about that person. That is an attribute that they bring to the table that solves a challenge on this project. Uh, something that's fun is to share something unusual about that person, something that, that makes them three dimensional. Like, they have five dogs or something that helps us see the person beyond just the resume. Um, the other thing that I think is really important to communicating your message is to tie the message to what matters to the client. So for example, in response to a question that they may have, you might say, because we know that schedule is something that is of critical importance to you, our solution is this. So always tying it to what matters to them and then wrap it up with a takeaway. So the bottom line is what this means to you is this. Mm -hmm. Make it easy for your listeners to follow along. And when you simplify the message, it allows you to do a couple of things. It helps the participants to focus on the core message and then vocally do things to help that part of the message stand out. What tends to happen is people just go through messaging and, and a data dump of information and so nothing stands out. So if you don't decide in advance what you really want your selection panel to remember, you're leaving it to chance. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, Wendy, do you have anything to add? No, I, I would agree. Um, you know, uh, we're always looking for, you know, what do you anticipate being the challenges of this project and what solutions have you thought of already? You know, it's, it's not necessarily something like this is the only way that you can fix this problem, but you've got one or two solutions on, you know, schedule or, uh, you know, working with subs or, you know, neighbor, <laughs> the impact of a neighborhood. Um, you know, a challenge ever, is it? No, not at all. <laughs> um, but, but, but you're thinking about what those challenges potentially can be for the project and you're, you're coming to the table with, you know, this has worked for us in the past or, you know, doing those anecdotal, you know, okay, we had this and this is how we uh, conquered it. Or we had, we learned this from a project, you know, we did this, it didn't quite work out. We had to readjust, but showing that, you know, the thought process behind how you're going to make it easy for us. Okay. Is that okay to say in an interview? Like, hey, this is something that you know, we didn't do great or something? That often can be a question of ours. You know, name something that didn't go right and what did you learn from it? Oh, okay. Man, you ask tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary. If it's okay, I'd like to add something to that. Please. So the best way to approach is, is to think of it in terms of a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. And so when you do it, you say, okay, on this project, this is something that, that didn't go as well as we had hoped. What we've learned since then is this, and what do we do differently now? And what's our success in having done it differently now? So it's not one of those things where you go, oops, our bad. You have to really show what you've changed mm -hmm. and the impact of those changes moving forward. Okay, perfect. Uh, I do have a question out to the audience. If you guys have any additional tips and tricks on whether it's the mechanics of lighting and visuals and and pre and post kind of interview or also on how to convey teamwork and communication skills, please do chime in. We'd love to hear if you guys have any best practices you wanna share with the group. Um, so thank you guys for that. All right, so I kind of covered the, the next question on my pre and post interview already. Uh, next question or next topic is just kind of overall BD practices in a virtual space. So getting back to what used to be, uh, marketing and BD types, there was a hashtag BD life. I, I found it very entertaining when they are, you know, out on the golf course and whatnot, um, or at happy hours and whatnot, hashtag BD life. Uh, that's essentially been taken away from us. So the, the question is, how can you still connect with clients and partners 
was such a basic building block of a work responsibility of a BD person, of a, a professional marketer is you need to connect with key clients and prospects. That's your job. How do you do that in a virtual space? So Hillary, I'm going to ask you first. Well, the simplest thing is to, instead of sending an email or instead of calling on the phone, set up a FaceTime meeting, find ways to connect and to, you know, make it real and human. Because if we don't have that opportunity to meet face to face, it, it's a disconnect. Like we all know that sending a text or sending an email is open to interpretation. Mm. So when you have that real time back and forth, it, it builds that connection and it builds that relationship. Okay, perfect. So your advice is to get face-to-face -face, even if it is through a screen? Definitely. Okay, Russ, how about you? Uh, well, uh, for existing clients, we're, we're still, um, you know, I mentioned uh, virtual happy hours. We're doing uh, some of that and we, we're, we wanna try to ramp it up even more and, and maybe even theme them in a way so that, you know, it's sort of, you know, because if you do them once a week, it can, maybe it's a little, you know, repetitive, but maybe once every other week on our bigger projects where you could um, potentially even have a theme going. And that's when it's fun to have the kind of Zoom backgrounds and you can ask people to, you know, put the background of where you wish you were right now kind of thing. Uh, somehow we spent uh, all the good weather cooped up in our houses and now all of a sudden, uh, it's 100 degrees, but um, and the other thing that I, I haven't explored a whole lot is you know the potential of we still have the ability to get stuff to people, right? So sending crumble cookies across the valley is not a difficult thing to do. So uh, that's sort of maybe that's the next frontier is like how can we you know uh, actually you know maybe send a, a little token of gratitude or whatever across town. Uh, uh, or, or maybe just sort of smuggle a bottle of uh, a bourbon and put in the in the front yard of, of somebody's house. I, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like, but that's uh, that's in the in the research and development stage. But okay, I mean, obviously, you have to do it all virtually and and connect somehow and uh, and manage those relationships. Yes, you do, Wendy. Question to you: uh, the things that have been mentioned is setting up the face through face to face via screen. Uh, uh, and whatnot, how often are you to doing these kinds of video chats or video meetings with, with prospective uh, service providers? Um, I, I, I think the, the virtual, as far as a face-to-face -face, is definitely more advantageous than just a phone call or an email or text. Um, you know, you, you want to get a connection with the individual. Um, and obviously if the face-to-face -face meetings are out, that's the next best thing is that you want to be able to attach the name to the face. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm almost thinking, boy, uh, as a BD, you could just start cranking those things out because you're not having to travel. So you can schedule, you know, you know, quite a few in a day if you want to and be able to reach out to the clients. Um, I don't know how it's affecting other agencies, but, you know, I'm definitely open to that kind of opportunity um, since we can't do face to face. Okay, so and I'll go for it, Hillary. One other thing, if I can add, um, even if you can't get a face to face meeting, record a video and send it to somebody, mm -hmm. you know, with an update, you know, from different people within your organization or within the team. And that's just a different, something that they're not expecting, but could be a really cool way to stay connected with people, even if you don't have an actual meeting. Okay, I like it. Very cool. So Wendy, question to you. Uh, well, this is just my interpretation. You probably don't want everybody just calling and being like, hey, Wendy, how you doing? Hey, Wendy, how you doing? You want right. to be What kinds of messages or is there something that like the public owners typically need that we could reach out and say, hey, I have this piece of information that I thought you might find, you might find useful. What types of messages, aside from like, hey, would you like to have a glass of wine at, you know, 11 in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual <laughs> happy at 11. Um, you know, as far as if there's, there's new, um, you know, I guess techniques or, or, um, skill sets that you're bringing to the table that we may not know about, you know, or if you've hired somebody that has got a new skill set that you didn't have before as an agency and sending out information on that. Um, 
the, you know, as far as definitely, you know, pre-scheduling <laughs> these meetings, if you're going to do a, a virtual face-to-face -face is um, not just a pop in, you know, I'm on Microsoft Teams going, hey, Wendy, can you talk now? You know, the, the scheduling is definitely uh, a must, but yeah, just kind of the latest and greatest of what you guys have got going. Okay. Russ, do you have any uh, messages that have really been effective or honestly, do you have anything that has not worked doing these BD practices in a virtual world that you would be willing to share? I, I can't, I can't, nothing comes to mind. Um, I mean, I, I'm spoiled. I have a BD group and, uh, and you know, those, those lessons are probably uh, happening in our BD department, but uh, I, I think, um, yeah, we'll have to do another, yeah, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Hillary, do you have any advice or anything that you've seen across um, firms that you work with that's been really effective or maybe not so effective? Uh, I think I've shared a lot of the things that have really worked. Um, I think the things that don't work are the things that we used to do. So I think being creative is the most important thing that you can bring to the table right now. And also having a purpose beside to connect with people, not mm -hmm. just to say, Hey, how's it going? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so to, to really come with some sort of purpose that you want to offer something or you have a question or ways that you can add value rather than just, showing up and saying, hey, what's up? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Predictions for the future. This is kind of my last question. Then we do have some audience, uh, some questions from the audience. So I will encourage all of our attendees, um, if you have any questions, use the Q&A. We're going to get to those questions here in just a moment. So a prediction for the future. Uh, I want to know from everybody, uh, are virtual interviews here to stay? Are we going to keep doing this even after, you know, when we say like everything's going to go back to normal, are uh, virtual interviews and meetings here to stay? So Wendy, I'm going to go to you. Um, I think uh, virtual meetings, I think there are definitely some advantages to that, um, but that's more once you get into a project. Um, from a procurement perspective, you know, I definitely feel there's more advantage of really getting to know who you want to work with in a face-to-face. -face. So I think as soon as that opens up, you know, we'll probably be going back to that for interviews, but I'm still, I'm liking the electronic submittals and all that. <laughs> so I think we're going to be staying with that uh, moving forward, but I, I definitely, I miss the face-to-face. -face. Sure. Okay. Hillary, what do you think? Are the virtual me meetings and interviews here to stay beyond? beyond this current restriction. I have to agree with Wendy. I think that once it becomes possible to do it in person, to do these interviews, because you get a different vibe in person that, than you can get on a screen. And while meetings and those types of things may shift and it's difficult to predict the future, clients know what they want, clients know what they like. And so this, opportunity to discover alternatives in ways to communicate helps them better understand what they like and what they don't like. Very good point. Russ, are virtual meetings and interviews here to stay? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, if you were to attend virtually uh, a meeting six months ago, it meant you were driving to something, you know, some other thing, or you were otherwise detained. And oftentimes, you'd, you know, you'd hear somebody chime in from their car on the freeway. And it was sort of like a taboo thing. It was like, oh, you know, my meeting's not important enough for you. And so you're jetting off to somewhere else. Uh, it's interesting now that, um, you know, all of a sudden, all these meetings, the camera's on, and people can be engaged and people can be productive and people are learning how to use these technologies. And I, I think certainly, um, I guess I'm echoing what everybody else is saying, but for meetings, there's going to be a shift, I think. And uh, we see what the impact on, you know, air pollution and commuting and the planet and all of those positives that can come out of this sort of accidentally. I think it's, um, there's going to be a much higher a mix of that uh, use of technology for meetings uh, in the future. 
And, you know, if there's anything positive that's coming out of all of this, it's like it's sort of forcing us to sort of really advance our abilities to do so many more things, not just meetings, but, um, you know, big chunks of what we used to do in the office are, are, are able to happen uh, remotely. And that's a whole other conversation about the future of workplace. Uh, <laughs> a topic a little bigger than today's uh, LMS. So, perfect. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Okay, we do have some audience questions, so I'm gonna go through those. Uh, so one of the things we kind of touched on, but I'm gonna ask it again, just as a real specific question. What do you think of incorporating a short video into the presentation? I can speak to that. So I was doing an interview prep a couple weeks ago, and the client limited the number of presenters to three. So what we did is we had two of our critical team members create a short video that was like a minute or 45 seconds to speak to the panel. And that was a neat way to invite in other voices that the panel could connect with, but also respect and honor what parameters the client has set forth. It's also great if you can get client testimonials on video. Mm. Hmm. Okay. That's a very interesting way to use it. Russ, Wendy? What are your thoughts on a uh, short video? The way our interviews are, are structured is that we've got, you know, so much time for the presentation and then so much time for Q and A. So it's up to you as far as how you want to do the presentation part of it. So whether that's just, you know, answering our questions live um, or, or have a, a PowerPoint along with the live, you know, questions, um, whether it's a video, I have had um, uh, uh, agencies use a video for somebody that couldn't attend for whatever reason, they were out of country or whatever, and they wanted to make sure that we got a chance to meet this individual in real time, so to speak, um, you know, versus just a name and possibly a picture. So, you know, that, that first half of the interview, you, you just have to build your presentation based upon the structure of whatever the agency is or whatever they're requiring. So, you know, as far as a video, that's, you know, if that's how you want to do that portion of it, then that it's, it's up to you. As long as you feel like you can get your message across. Okay, perfect. Russ, what do you think about videos? Uh, I think, Sure, I'm not not a problem. Uh, I would I'd be concerned about you know rehearsing a lot of times and making sure that the video is compressed properly and it's not sort of choppy and jumping across the screen. Um, I I got kicked out of this. Thing. I don't know if you guys saw me disappear and come back, but mm -hmm. um, you know I don't know what's going on, but. Uh, maybe my daughter and her friend woke up and uh, got <laughs> online, but the unpredictability of signal strength, you know, mm -hmm. the video is sort of chopping and, and uh, uh, not working, obviously, probably not as valuable as, uh, as you would have hoped, but uh, if you can get it to work, that's great. Okay, cool. All right, next one. Uh, sometimes the owner's questions are so scripted that following them uh, how can we share specific project approaches when the questions restrict your content? Oh, that sounds like a me question. Um, yeah. okay. so, so part of how we approach, well, it's the RQs, the interviews and all that, is that we have to be consistent across the board. We have to ask the same questions to everybody so that it's a level playing field and we're not going off on tangents and all this kind of things. So if, if it feels like our questions are scripted, they are, um, you know, and, and we're, we're all following as panel members the same kind of questions. But I, for us, we, we, we tend to, or we hope we are leaving it open for interpretation so that it's broad enough that you can bring in what you feel is pertinent content to the questions and the uh, the Q and A is always going to be um, it's a surprise. You know, we we want to see how quickly people think on their feet and really how they draw from their own personal experiences to be able to answer the questions. Um, the the presentation part is very specific. We have to include that in the RFQ. 
So um, you at least have a general understanding of what we're looking for. Um, a lot of it is the same kind of questions that we asked in the, the RFQ, but this gives you the opportunity to expand upon if you couldn't you know, include everything in the page limitations, you can add to it as part of your presentation. Um, you know, so we're scripted for a reason so that, that we don't have um, protests and things like that, and that we're being fair to everybody um, and getting asked the same questions. Okay, Wendy, Hillary, I'm sorry, Hillary, Russ, do you have anything to add? How do you share more specific project approaches when the questions limit your content? Sure, I'll go if that's okay, Russ. Um, there are a couple ways. Uh, first off, on occasion, the folks that are evaluating the proposals are not the same people as are on the selection panel for the interview. So if that is the case, then you're dealing with a fresh set of eyes and ears who are not familiar with you at all. And so you have to be cognizant of that. Um, the second thing is oftentimes owners ask about process and procedure, which from company to company can be very similar. So on, on questions like that, I always say, okay, do a graphic which shows all the different steps but then focus and zero in on what you do to go above and beyond that. Mm -hmm. What is your differentiator? So in a, in a presentation, there are things that I call equalizers, which level the playing field with you and the other participants, but you've got to really focus on the differentiators. And one of the clear ways to differentiate yourself is in your approach. What are the, the unique things that you can do that are going to bring value and solve problems for the client. So those are the things you need to focus on, the differentiators, not so much the equalizers. Okay. Russ, anything to add on making sure your specific project approaches come across? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think that what comes to mind is, you know, and I think it's sort of building upon what Hillary already uh, sort of teed up for me here is, you know, sometimes sort of step out of the sort of diagram and the, and the schedule, you know, and the, and the sort of, real mechanical way of answering things and, and tell a story about a project where, uh, where that, where you were successful or where you sort of overcame something. Um, it's always a lot easier to kind of connect through storytelling on some of these things. Um, so if you've got a great example of when it worked really well and, um, you know, that's just uh, an idea. Perfect. I love adding the stories, the, the lessons learned, the, the project specific stories. So that's a, that's a good one for sure. All right, a uh, follow up question from somebody else is how closely should we follow the interview questions or the outline provided by the owner? Very. <laughs> How's that? One word. Um, you know, and, and it's just like with when we're evaluating the SOQs, you know, we put things in order for a reason. We're evaluating things in order for a reason. If you're going to make us hunt and peck through your presentation um, of answering the questions and flipping pages and going here and there, um, it is, it's challenging. And depending upon the project, if we're evaluating a lot of SOQs or, you know, whatever, it's, it gets old really quick if we're having to really search for the answers we're looking for. So it's important to, to stay in the flow that we've outlined, even if it doesn't necessarily make sense to you, follow the order. Okay. It just makes it easy on everybody. Hillary, Russ, anything to add to that? I'd agree with that. Um, this, the only thing that I would definitely make sure of is if they've asked for the team credentials later on, you still need to do an introduction of who's speaking at the very beginning because mm -hmm. if they don't know who's talking that's problematic for example if your project manager is starting off and goes through two slides without introducing him or herself then that can be very confusing so one of the most important things is to just make it easy on your listener to follow along and to go along with you and to, to not have to hunt for information. Okay, Russ? 
Yeah, I mean, I we we don't want to trip up or jeopardize, the, you know, the, the the those who are evaluating our our proposal's ability to kind of score because typically there's I would assume Wendy you have some sort of scoring system, yeah, you know, for section. So if they've got a stack of fifteen books on a table, I mean, having reviewed them myself for uh, being invited to review general contractors' proposals, I mean, it's sort of like so fatiguing to have to yeah run around looking for things so definitely uh, we All follow right. the rules we have about five <laughs> minutes left i love this question i'm saving it for the end uh so i'm going to give credit chad with smith group i love your question uh so if everything goes to pot <laughs> i'm going to reward it a little bit everything goes to pot wi-fi goes down in the interview lose your presentation people are cutting in and out is there a way to recover and still win and should you just continue on or can you ask to reschedule? Like what's the constraints on, you know, recovering when things out of your control kind of go bad? Well, first I would ask Wendy because she's, you know, in charge of things like procurement and the rules. So then we can answer after that. Okay, fair enough. I was gonna go to Wendy first, but I was like, man, I'm picking on Wendy. I keep asking Wendy first. That's okay. I mean, you know, and, and this is all new ground, I think, for all of us. Um, uh, if your Wi-Fi goes bad or your presentation goes off, this is all the more reason that, um, you know, send, send us your slides ahead of time. Um, you know, if we end up having to drop the, the whole uh, video part of it, and then we've got to have everybody, you know, time will stop and then we do a call in instead. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, those are the options that we've got, but um, you know, it's, it's probably no different than live. You know, what if the, all of a sudden the computer decides to take a dump and, and you can't do your video presentation live for us. You know, if, if there isn't a, uh, leave behind, you know, maybe you planned on it being a leave behind. Well, now it's not a leave behind. It's, it's your backup. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, having that all available for the panel members is, I, th I think, key because then you can anticipate, okay, if we, if we lose all video, if we, if we're losing, you know, through whatever, you know, format that we're following, um, then we've got the option of being able to call in and we've got those backups in place, which I'm adding to my list now, making sure that we make that available for our first um, virtual interview that'll be coming up. Okay. Russ and Hillary, backup plans, or it, I guess even a more basic question to me is, when do you call it? When do you say like, okay, this is not going well and we need to try something else. Do you have any advice for us on that? Well, well, I mean, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, so, uh, having the audio on your phone is, you know, I suppose you could try to talk them through it. I mean, with the advanced copy uh, sent already a few hours ahead of time and just the audio, I think you could probably survive um, unless, you know, by some miracle, the, the phone lines went down, but uh, that would be scary. But I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly possible that you look out the window and the Cox truck is pulling up across the street and halfway through your presentation, you have no internet. So, I mean, I, I, that's why I love to really emphasize, use the audio on your telephone. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's all I would say. Other than that, I just call up Wendy and beg for a, a redo <laughs> and see if I can. All right. The other benefit of using your phone and having it close by is you can easily access Zoom on your phone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes your phone has backup through your, so it, sometimes it's connected to your Wi-Fi in-house, but then it also has the backup of the Wi-Fi through your ser service. Data. So that might be a solution. Okay, so a backup plan. So whether it be an additional Zoom or different platform, uh, dropping to audio only, using the visuals, the, the separate files sent ahead of time. Sounds like it could be pretty pretty reasonably, you know, I would say like a, add a suspenders when you're wearing a belt, like belts and suspenders. <laughs> so you don't get caught with pants down. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Cool, okay, we have just a couple more questions. It is nine o'clock, so I will say anybody that has to jump off right at nine, thank you so much for coming.
Uh, just a, a note, you will get a full transcript. You will get a link to the video for all of our registered attendees. Uh, I have a few more questions. Uh, and anybody who wants to stay on, I do leave the chat open. So I'll leave it open until at least 930, as long as anybody wants to hang out, get whatever virtual networking we can possibly get. Um, so I'm going to ask just one more question. Uh, tips and tricks for reading the room on a virtual interview. So interview prep, I've sat through a couple interview prep sessions and trainings and reading the room is kind of a topic that, that's covered routinely in interview prep and training. Uh, that's a little more interesting on a, on a virtual interview. So I'm gonna to go to you first, Hillary. Tips and tricks for reading the room in a virtual interview. Well, here's the, the thing that's interesting is that a lot of research suggests that when people are nervous, they interpret other things very differently than they do if they're calm. Um, the other thing is, is that many people misinterpret cues or they focus on the wrong cues. For example, let's say somebody had really something really interesting for lunch and they've got a tummy issue. They may look like they're in distress because they are, but it has nothing to do with your presentation. It has to do with what they had for lunch. Sure. So stick to your plan. How do you want to come across regardless of how they may be responding because if there is any likelihood you could misinterpret it and then inappropriately alter your message that's risky okay excellent uh russ i'm gonna go to you anything to add how to read the room well uh we like to try to understand i mean hopefully we already know the the client i mean most projects you know that's a that's usually a key, uh, you know, the goal is to go into these things knowing at least somebody on the, on the interview panel. But those that we don't know, we do a lot of research on, try to understand what they're all about. You know, if there's a maintenance person on the interview, we sort of get a sense of what their hot buttons are. I mean, so it's not as much as reading body language as it's knowing kind of what, what, you know, what, what's their hot button, what they're going to care about. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they can find out a lot online um, or through, you know, friend of a friend of a friend. So we, we try to go into it knowing, you know, hey, this can be a serious interview or uh, in a recent interview, you know, one of the panelists was kind of, you know, a little, a little bit of a jokester. So we could sort of let our hair down a little bit. So, um, you yeah, know, just research. Okay. Perfect. Wendy, anything to add? Nope. I mean, I think you guys pretty much summed it up. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to actually launch our second poll. So I did create a second poll, just the feedback kind of at the end. wanted to see what the best part of, uh, of this LMS is. So please do take a moment if you could share your feedback with us. Uh, very similar to the questions that we asked up front, what were you looking for? Also wanted to get the feedback at the end. What do you think was the best part? So highlights of the, of the morning. Let's see if we can get 80% participation. We did have a few people drop off. We're sitting about 70 people now. I love watching all the feedback. This is, this is the best part for us. And Let's by see. the way, if, if you come up, up, up with a question afterwards, feel free to email me. Ah, um, good point. I'm, I'm definitely, you know, want to be able to assist in any way that I can. Yes. And there are a couple more questions that we didn't really have a chance to answer. Um, I think they'll be written. I, I think our panelists will probably chime in um, in written form. And those will be part of the post-event recap and materials that we distribute to everybody. So about one minute, and I usually give it about two to three minutes to answer a poll. This one has one question. Should be pretty good, pretty easy to answer. Yeah, I'm looking at Bill's question about other collaborative platforms. Um, I think each agency, depending upon their um, IT department and what they allow, will be um, uh, uh, more the answer there. Um, so are you referring to electronic submittals of proposals and IFBs? Is that yeah, yeah. I, I think that's what I'm interpreting the question as. So um, yeah, it's just it's going to be dependent upon the agency. So get a feel quickly about um, you know, what they're looking for. And, and it should be in the document as far as how they're requesting the information to be submitted to the cities. Sure. Okay. 
We're sitting at about 72, 70%, uh, 72% of respondents have chimed in on our question on our, um, what's the best part of today's webinar. Thank you guys for that. Thank you everybody for your feedback. And I'll let it go just for another well, 20 seconds or so. All right, we hit our 75% participation. So any last respondents? We've got just another couple seconds here if you wanted to answer our poll question. And I will let that go. And let's share all the results. Okay, so thank you everybody who participated. Love to see your feedback. So best part of today, it's the virtual interview skills and the public owner's perspective. So thank you, Wendy, for agreeing to participate. I knew you'd be popular. <laughs> Yay, Wendy. And I didn't even vote for myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it, I love it, excellent. Well again, thank you so much for participating. It's yeah. about 905. Uh, I'm happy to stay on. I will leave the chat open. Um, and then we do have just a couple more Q&A. Uh, like I said, we'll probably answer these in written form as well. Um, I think we covered some of these, like how important is the visual look and feel of the presentation? Um, actually, what do you think, panelists? How important is it, look and feel? Uh, they're talking about the visual pre presentation, the virtual presentation. Yeah, I would say like the, the image of the panelists or the image of the, the interviewees. I mean, I, I think it's similar to what Hillary was talking about um, earlier is just being able to have a clear picture of the, the person, be cognizant of what's behind you and, um, you know, but as far as any fancy things and all that kind of stuff, yeah, we want to know the person. Gotcha. Perfect. And then we'll go through best leave behind ideas. We've talked about that quite a bit, uh, the leave behinds, whether it's the slides or, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, materials and whatnot. So I think we covered that one too. So thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, we will do another LMS here in a couple of weeks. I'm probably going to interview a panel, hopefully of owners to talk about what they're, what they're working on and um, what they're all doing. So thank you guys so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks. If you'd like to take off, go for it. And everybody who's still here, uh, you're welcome to continue on with the chat. I like reading the comments. Those are probably my favorite. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I love that. Refreshing to have human contact. And you that. It is kind of nice. It's nice to see people like that I know too, right? To get people on the screen like, I know you, I've seen you before. Like, yeah, we talk. I feel like I can reconnect with people. Yep. Yeah. Well, and you guys have definitely given me some ideas as far as what I have to think about for our first virtual interview. Ah, fantastic. That's yeah. Cool. You got something out of that too. Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, I, I think this is, you know, you know, maybe more so on the um, the private side, you know, have more experience with things like this. On the public side, you know, we were, we're so used to the hands-on, face-to-face stuff that, um, you know, we were one day working in the office and the next day, boom, you have to go home and trying to um, figure out the logistics of how to work from home for a lot of us was a challenge. And dare I say this, the uh, stereotypical reputation of a public entity is maybe a little more rigid, a little more... Yeah, potentially, uh, potentially. Maybe but, a uh, little more comfortable in the Tempe, same Tempe way. Tempe is a kinder, gentler city. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we, we've had some wiggle room with it. But, um, you know, it definitely, it, God bless our IT department. They really had to you know, jump on things and, you know, you know, all of a sudden we're getting all these laptops in and 
cell phones ordered for people who didn't have it and people who didn't have Wi-Fi at home, believe it or not. I mean, it's just been, um, it was, it was quite the challenge for the first couple of weeks because you know, we went from zero to, um, <laughs> 150, you know, in, in a couple of days. And so it was, it was a challenge, but we got, we got it working and um, employees who were apprehensive about trying to figure out how to work from home are somewhat embracing it. Good. And, um, and someone, one of my staff that I thought for sure, as soon as the city opened, she's like, okay, I'm in the office. I don't care. And she's like, well, maybe not so fast. So, you know, it's, Yeah. It's, it's definitely um, an interesting time, but it's forced things that I know I've been trying to push and get going uh, to the forefront a lot faster. So that was good. Yeah. Very cool. I think it was you, Russ, that said March 12th was like the last day of, uh, you know, yeah. it was. the time that was March 12th. I had a huge event that I do for ADOT every year. It was March 12th. And for like the three oh, wow. days leading up to it, I was like not sleeping. I was like, are they going to cancel this thing? Like things are starting to happen and, and I'm a little nervous. Yeah. And we pulled it off. They didn't cancel. Yeah, it was it. weird. It was up half the night, like going, am I going to get a text? Like, oh, the event's off. So you're, you're, you're done. You're not doing this. Mm -hmm. So we did it. And then by the end of the day, it was like, yeah, that wouldn't have happened. It was two days from now. They canceled yeah. like, the Red Awards that night. I was supposed to go to the Red Awards. Mm -hmm. And like four o'clock in the afternoon, so that was canceled. So... I had a guy driving up from Tucson for the Red Awards, and I stopped him at Picacho Peak and turned him back around because the Red Awards <laughs> were canceled. Well, they, they canceled them like an hour before they were supposed to start. It was right. over two hours. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, we, we did our event in the morning. Like, our event ran from 7 to noon. And I literally, by like 7 a.m., I was like, doors are open. I guess we're doing this thing. <laughs> so we're definitely doing this. Crazy. And then, yeah, we had a lower attendance. We had added a bunch of things like, please don't shake hands, don't uh, do anything. We put, we made up these little stickers that have like preferred engagement. So we had like toe taps or elbow bumps or um, <laughs> you know, whatever it was. And we did like the, oh, what was the, the live, live long and prosper? Oh yeah. The oh, yeah. <laughs> All those different greetings we had yeah. like yep. made up and we passed them out and said like, hey, if you just want to encourage some non-traditional way of greeting, <laughs> we encourage that. It, it came oh, that's well. cool. I was pretty stressed out for the two weeks after because I guess that was the, the like within two weeks, you know, if anybody tested positive, we were going to get a whole plan mm -hmm. in place. But man, I was stressful. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, March yeah. 12th, it's a day I won't for, soon forget. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> we'll see yeah. After that. yeah. So, Wendy, you actually have a couple well, questions. Are you open to doing debriefs as in like a virtual uh, Zoom? Oh, session? definitely. You know, in, in fact, I, I, I had scheduled one just before the shutdown, but we ended up having to do it over the phone. Um, you know, some of it is I've got, you know, a whole bunch of information in the office and it's not scanned. Mm. So that, that can create a challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the key things I do after, um, whenever we're doing scoring, whether it's SOQ or, or uh, interview, is that I'm, I'm asking for notes that I can put into my uh, electronic document so that when somebody wants a debrief, I've got the notes there. Oh, from the, the other members of the selection yes. panel? Yeah, gotcha. yeah. So I, so I get all the feedback um, into this document so that at least I've got that that I can go off of if I can't get into the office to get any of the written comments to review because, um, you know, uh, Hillary was right. We can't do debriefs until the contract's awarded. So even when we've identified the short or the final list and we're negotiating with number one, um, you know, until it's awarded, it can still potentially blow up. Now, has it ever happened? No, but sure enough, I'm going to do, you know, I do a debrief with somebody and all of a sudden it blows up and they were number two and it's like, yeah, okay, that's not good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it can be sometimes a couple months and information isn't necessarily fresh in my head at that time. You've done a few things between now and then, huh? <laughs> just a little, just a little bit. But I also include whoever um, our project manager is internally mm -hmm. in those debriefs usually so that they're, they're bringing more of their um, 
technical understanding or or um, uh, notes and that type of thing into the debrief as well. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Another question, Wendy. Uh, question to you, Wendy, is: Have you ever met with uh, contractors or consultants to get their perspective on the submittal and procurement process and interview process? Um, you know what? Not not directly per se. Um, I mean, I've definitely been part of this process where I'm getting, I'm hearing information and feedback, but I've never done a direct outreach to um, GCs or even consultants, you know, getting their input with our process. Okay. Okay. And then hey, I'm uh, going to jump off, but Wendy, it's very nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Russ. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Yeah. See you around. Okay. Take care. All right. So yeah, Wendy, that was really fun. Yeah, I, like no, I, I enjoy it. I think I get a little bit less stressed about doing these virtually than I do in person. So maybe that's some benefit to it. Well, and, and uh, you know, and now I'm stressing over <laughs> my first virtual one on how we're going to accomplish it. So yeah, you got this. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it done. Okay. I think it's well, definitely thanks. a practice session is probably in order exactly. for at least for everybody, right? Both sides. You know, exactly. So, yeah. All right, cool. All right, thank you so much, Wendy. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Right, Good to see you. Good to see you, too. All right, so for everybody who's still on, I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off. Um, I'm going to leave the chat open for as long as you like, um, and I'll probably shut it off about 9.30. So I'm going to put a time limit on it. Nine, it's 9.16 now. I'll shut it off at 9.30. So thank you all so much for coming in. Great to see everybody. Great to see some names on the list that I haven't been able to hang out with lately. So yeah, can't wait to see you guys in person again. Take care. We'll see you soon. <laughs>